the project risk scores are an important research and healthcare tool that many people have not heard about. They're starting to be used by doctors on patients as part of dis do disease screening, particularly when there's a family history of disease. Uh, for example, they've started being used in as part of like breast cancer screening. And one of our key goals for today is to find better ways to talk to people about the polygenic risk scores. So fundamentally, I'll go back. Ah, sorry. Um, polygenic risk scores are a way we can use your DNA to give us a prediction of what your future health might be like. Uh, so a reminder about how DNA works. DNA is um, something that's in every cell of our body. It's a sequence of building blocks uh, that tell our body how to make itself. These building blocks are grouped into genes and each gene controls certain proteins and things that happen within our body. We inherit our DNA from our biological parents and then we add a little bit of extra mixing and mutation just to make us super unique. But the vast majority of human DNA is actually completely identical, which is why we look like people and not fish or bananas. But there are small differences that we call genetic variants, which is why you don't look exactly like me. There are a couple of different names we use for these, so we call them variants, variations, mutations, uh, and also uh, if you read the, uh, the literature a lot, you'll see SNPs, which stands for Singular Nucleotide Polymorphism. Uh, and all of them mean the same thing, which is fundamentally at some point in your DNA, something is slightly different to other people. So if you look at the picture I've got up, most of this DNA is the same, but at just one single position, one person has a C and another person has a T. And that might have no effect whatsoever, or it might cause a huge difference in how that person's body um, behaves. These SNPs can be, you know, so common that, you know, half the population has one version, half has another, or they can be so, so rare that only a few people in the world have them. And we can take these variants and build up an association with disease. So first of all, we sequence their DNA, find out exactly what DNA they do and don't have, we decide what disease we want to know about and then split the people whose DNA we've collected into two groups, the people with the disease and without the disease. And we look at whether or not there's a difference in commonality between what variants are appearing. And we can talk about this as an association, that certain variants are associated with people having a particular disease. Um, so the example I've put up, in one case, you know, that there is far more copies of the C variant in people with heart disease than there are in the people without heart disease. And the chance of this happening randomly is very, very small. What these variants do is show us areas that might be causing the problems that lead to these disease, but also possibly not. Variants tend to move around in blocks and the actual cause might be just in a nearby region. If you go to a lot of genetics talks, like I do, you know, I don't know, you might not have much to do at the weekends and in the evenings. You, you often see a lot of graphs that look like this, what are called Manhattan plots, which is a way of trying to plot out how unlikely certain changes would be to be just randomly occurring. So here, here you know, this sort of distribution between these two groups is very unlikely to happen. Um, but this one up at the top here, we'll be talking about 15 zeros before we got uh, before we got a number. So the more unlikely that it is to have happened by chance, the more likely we think, hmm, well, we better investigate that and find out if that's causing something. Now, some diseases just caused by a single change, but some diseases like coronary artery disease can be influenced by lots of changes. Now, if you've just got a single gene change, in some ways that's a bit easier to understand what's going on because fundamentally either you have the variant that causes that or you don't. But where we've got variant, lots and lots of different things that are contributing, it's more difficult to think what's going on. And this is where that polygenic part of the risk score name comes from. And the idea here is we don't need to know exactly what areas are causing the disease to make a risk score. We just need to take the most highly associated variants and estimate how each one affects your likelihood and then just add them all up and try to assign 
where you are relative to the rest of the population to create a score. And that score value can be communicated to doctors and patients in you know, several different ways. Um, so you could say, you know, you are at very high risk. You could say you're 40 times more likely to get the disease than the average person. Uh, or you could say you're at higher risk than 90% of people, you know, for people who are right up here in this high risk category. And one of the difficulties is a positive risk score only explains your relative risk. So we can't, it can't be used to say, you know, there's a one in 10 chance this will happen. All we can do is say, well, we think it's much more likely than the average person. And so, well, we might sometimes get some absolute values for either end. For a lot of the people, particularly in the middle, it's very difficult to get what that means in an absolute sense. Worse, it's not a guaranteed prediction. So just because you've got a high risk score, you aren't necessarily going to get the disease. Just because you've got a low risk score doesn't mean you're um, going to not get the disease. There's a lot of other factors that come into play other than just genetics. Also, what a risk score means might change a lot across your life. Because if I told someone who was 22, they were at very high risk of getting coronary heart disease, they'd probably be quite concerned. If I told someone at 98 that they're at a very high genetic risk of getting coronary heart disease and they haven't got it yet, they're probably not going to be very worried. And so it's gonna have very different lifetime understandings depending on what age you find out about it. Also, our understanding of polygenic risk is still rapidly changing, which makes this quite difficult to communicate to people. Um, so there are apps, public facing apps at the moment that use like data from 23andMe to try and give people an estimate of their risk of heart disease. And they recently updated from a version that used 68 variants to one that used 150. And with that extra data, a lot of people saw their results dramatically change. So what this graph is trying to give a sense of is, so for example, this blue line here is sort of showing the people who were originally at low risk for the early score and what their risk they were told after the update. And you see some of the people who are low risk were then told, actually, you're at high risk and we were wrong. And some of the people who are at high risk actually moved down into the low risk category. Um, and this is not because the original prediction was wrong per se, but we've got more information now, which, you know, able people to place them more accurately. And those sorts of updates are probably going to keep coming for a while. And telling people the wrong risk information or information they misunderstand could actually be dangerous to people who are told, you know, that they're at high risk and are uh, incorrectly might make people particularly an uh, anxious or cause them to seek out treatments that they don't need. Being told that you're at low risk incorrectly might mean you don't make lifestyle changes that actually might be a good idea. So one obvious question in this is, this is all very good, but what's Cambridge doing about this? Um, I'm going to hand over to Sam for a second and leave my slides up, but hopefully he will jump in and unmute oh. himself. <clears throat> Hi, can you hear me? Oh, good. Yeah, so I'm Sam. I'm one of the researchers um, at Cambridge um, in the Department of Public Health and Primary Care who works on um, polygenic scores along with uh, Mike Inouye who couldn't be here today. But I'll just talk a little bit about sort of why we're interested in these things and what we do in our department about polygenic scores. So I think the first thing we do is we're trying to, to develop new polygenic scores and that can better predict cardiovascular diseases. So our department has developed two of the best scores that predict um, risk of heart disease. So there's like heart attack um, and things like that, as well as strokes. And so really we're trying to integrate all this data, like genetic data and health um, data to basically predict your risk um, the best we can using genetics. The second thing we do is that this data is like really all over the place. It's in different journals, it's in different publications, it's made by people in different countries with different data sets. And a lot of what we do is try and just organize this data in a database or a catalog to basically get a good knowledge of what the state of the art of genetic risk prediction is um, using polygenic scores. And so we have this database called the Polygenic Score Catalog, which anyone can look at. 
and we can put the link in the chat um, where you can basically just see all the different um, traits that could be predicted using genetics um, and for all the different traits and diseases that that entails. But there we put information about how these scores were developed. And really importantly, we put information about who these scores were developed for or like who contributed data for these scores. So this includes things about how old were the people who um, were having their genetics, um, be, their risk be predicted or like uh, what ancestry or ethnicity are these people, what, um, how many were male and female and things like that, which are really important to know how the scores were developed so that we know who they might work best on um, when you actually go to use them. And the second or the last thing we do is basically try to close the knowledge gap about um, how well these scores work. So a lot of these scores, I think Amy in the next slide will talk about how a lot of these scores don't work so well um, in people of uh, non-European or basically non-white ancestry or ethnicity, because a lot of the genetic data that's been collected worldwide um, has been primarily in people of European or white ancestry. And so um, we're trying to basically collaborate with other cohorts in different countries um, and also within the UK with people of more diverse ancestry, so African ancestry, South Asian ancestry, East Asian ancestry, and things like that, to basically get a good idea or a better idea about how well these scores actually work with diverse people in diverse countries. So these are sort of the three threads of what we're working on in Cambridge, but really is trying to develop better predictors and then find out how well they work in a systematic way so that they could be applied. Brilliant. Thank you, Sam. Um, yeah, so as Sam said, I will talk just a little bit about genetic diversity because one of the um, sort of big selling points of the um, PGS catalog is being able to see, um, I'll just go back for a second, uh, where, what the ancestry that these data sets have been built and evaluated on is. Uh, and sort of the short answer is white people. Uh, so this is a graph here on this side showing over the years what, you know, what sort of populations have genetic risk scores, have uh, genetic uh, information being collected on, uh, where, where, where red is white European people and you see they make up the bulk of it despite only being a much smaller part of the global population and one of the consequences of this is risk scores tend to be less accurate in groups that aren't European. So the second graph is trying to express the inaccuracy of risk scores where if we imagine if we take the risk score to be at an accuracy of one in, in the group that it was designed in Europeans how does it compare in other groups and the answer is well, not as well, like you're looking at sort of working half as well for a lot of them in South Asian groups. And when you get down to people with African ancestry, the predictive value of these scores can actually be really quite bad. And as we said earlier, if the risk score isn't accurate, it can actually lead to bad outcomes. And that's, that's not good. As I said earlier, we're starting to see project risk scores more and more in clinical practice, as well as in research. And there are lots of potential benefits to this area of research. What, there's a chance that you could get diagnosed with something before you even start having symptoms. So that rather than that concept we have at the moment of you get ill and then we treat it and then you get somewhat better, perhaps we could preemptively manage to manage things so that you never actually get to the point of getting ill and having the problems associated with the disease because we've managed to already diagnose and measure what's going on. Similarly, we might be able to, if you know you're at high risk for particular things, you might be able to change how you're behaving now to lower your risk in other ways. So that rather than you know getting to 60 and going, gosh, I, I wish I'd smoked less because of its impact on this one specific thing that's now causing me problems, you can almost do that in advance. But there are downsides that come with it as well. So we've seen with uh, cystic fibrosis that it is very possible to add genetic discrimination into the fun things our society does, where uh, in the US mortgage companies and jobs refuse to lend money to rent houses, to give jobs to people who were 
um, at risk of sickle cell disease. Uh, there's also this problem of because they're less accurate outside of white European groups, we might be intensifying the racial inequalities that already exist within our healthcare system. So we might be adding a tool that, you know, probably the tool will help everyone, but it's going to help certain groups a lot more. And is it really fair to include that in? So uh, probably this is something we would come back to a lot more in a later uh, workshop. But what we'd really like to do now is hopefully go into a breakout room and talk about, about how this has gone.